I'm asking each laureate about uh, some of their roots, how they got started. And uh, you, uh, you're quite proud of your Midwestern roots, from what, I, from what I've gathered and uh, reading about you. How, uh, how did those roots shape your values and your world view in, in ways that helped you succeed in the business world and in leading, a, in leading a satisfying life as well? Well, I, I wouldn't trade my Midwestern heritage for anything. Uh, while at the time I didn't realize the value of growing up in the Midwest, in, in retrospect, and really only recently I've I've come to understand that that the uh, lifestyle and growing up in the Midwest, not that I would ever trade my graduate education and my exposure to the East very shortly after I got through college, but I wouldn't trade the fact that I grew up in a small town in the Midwest, and it seemed to me to give, it's given me sort of a sense of balance and, and uh, that in, in, uh, in combination with the sophistication of an Eastern education, which I also was lucky enough to have, uh, I think I became a person that I would consider fairly well-rounded. But in looking back, I, uh, I thought the, the opportunity to grow up in the Midwest was one that, I, uh, that was, has proven very valuable to me. You described it as uh, having a, giving you a sense of clear-headed realism and unambiguous ethics. How did it do that? I think that's an overstatement. Okay. Uh, I, I just think that it there's a sense of balance and a sense of appreciation of, of a broad s sense of, of, of values that you gain from living in, in the environment of the Midwest. Um, I'm not sure it has done much for my clarity of thinking. Were there role models that, that influenced you on the way out? Well, I think everyone has teachers and professors that one remembers um, as having played a significant role in one's past. I, I had two or three of those going back to third grade mm -hmm. and then in high school, and certainly I had one or two in college and one or two at, uh, in graduate school and then I've had then I had at least one or two in the business world who uh, were just giant men who uh, they, they did think clearly and they helped me learn the process of decision making so I think everyone in their life could identify five or six people who helped them become what they eventually turned out to be. Would you mind talking about a couple of them? Pardon? Would you mind talking about a couple of them and, and what they might have passed along to you? Well, there was an, an executive vice president of FMC who was brought in from academia, as a matter of fact, an unusual combination of backgrounds. And he was a very insightful uh, person who um, had, was courageous in his decision making, could walk through plants and tell you immediately uh, what the problems were and um, what kind of management style was being used and what changes should be should be made so there are a few people like that that I think everyone has has um, been exposed to and, and benefited from knowing in one's career what was his name his name was dr. Carl Prutton okay. as you look as you look around you today uh, you're in a different business situation than you might have been when you started in your career it's truly global competition today what sort of values should today's corporate leader possess? Are you asking the question, differentiating the values that one had when I started my business career? Um, no, but what sort of um, what sort of world view should they possess today? You know, strategic thinking toward uh, dealing with a truly global economy. Oh, I, I, obviously. The challenges of business today were very different than when I started. I don't think the values that one has as a leader should be any different today than they were then. I think they're fairly constant. So if you talk about the need for different kinds of understanding, the different management techniques that are required, the different relative importance of various aspects of the total decision-making process in, in business, obviously they are different today. Uh, certainly during my career I've seen business go from one that was incredibly provincial 
At least that's the way I would describe it in retrospect. At the time, I thought it was relatively sophisticated. But uh, to one that is definitely global uh, and where um, it, it's, it's very obvious, this is, this is not very insightful, that those companies who succeed are going to understand that they are, that the world is their market and that their competitors exist throughout the world and they have to be sensitive and conscious and, and, and businesses have to learn how to deal with different cultures and they have to be sensitive to the significance of those cultures and uh, as, a, as American businessmen we have to learn how to adopt to the cultures in the countries where we have to, uh, to operate. And I think too many Americans historically, maybe some even today, think that we are so advanced in terms of our modus operandi and our culture that we will benefit the rest of the world by bringing uh, all these assets to them. And uh, those who understand that that's not the case are going to be the ones that succeed. So we're learning a lot from people in other countries as, as we sit down and make our own decisions. Um, you, you speak about the, the value of having a, a complete outlook, a, a well-rounded person. Uh, not just confined narrowly to the very uh, the, the, the core issues in their business. Uh, could you speak to that as far as uh, what a complete person is in your view? Well, I don't think I want to take on a complete person. Uh, what I would be willing to do is talk about a complete businessman sure. because I don't want to b <laughs> fly sure. under false pretenses. I have been a businessman. And it seems to me that the difference between those who succeed and those who don't are those that have an ongoing curiosity, who continue to learn, who, uh, who continue to reach out for things that are not directly associated with their businesses, but all of which have peripheral value to them as, as businessmen. And I think we can go back in our, in our own careers, all of us, and think of the number of people who are voted most likely to succeed in kindergarten and in grade school and high school, college, even graduate school, and how many of those that were perceived by their peers as those that were going to take over the world in fact haven't. What is the difference between those who are perceived as having those leadership capabilities in, their early, in the early parts of their career and those that in fact turn out to have them? Uh, I, I claim it's those who continue to grow, those who continue to, to be, become educated, those that are curious. That's the, the, the simplest common denominator I, I have to describe those people who I think during a, the course of a long career uh, tend to lead. How has that, uh, how's that uh, been a factor in your own life? You, you have widely varied interests uh, from politics to the environment. You're curious about a lot of things. Well, I would have to say that none of it was a conscious effort on my part. I didn't say I will be a more successful businessman if I get, if I take an interest in politics or if I take an interest in public policy organizations. Uh, those were interests that I had and where pursuing those interests clearly had benefit to me, at least I perceived they did, in terms of my own career. But at no point do I remember saying, I must reach out. Uh, it is in my best interest to do these other things in terms of what I'm trying to be. They all were sort of natural interests, but they clearly had an impact on, on one's success in, in business. At least that's my perception. I also feel very strongly that business leadership today has to become involved in the external world, whether it be uh, contributing to Ely Mossner institutions that need business thinking or whether it, it, it means becoming involved in politics. I think if businessmen do not businessmen do not become involved in politics they deserve what they get uh, and that means understanding issues uh, it doesn't necessarily mean running for office but it does mean understanding issues it means knowing the candidates knowing who you're voting for uh, the positions that they're going to take because basically we, 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 we should be electing people to exercise their intellect and we have to understand what that intellect is and what positions those people are going to take and we have to work very hard to, to elect the people that we think are, are going to uh, function and govern in the best interests of society including the business community. 
So I think a, a businessman who does not become involved in politics is not, in the long run, going to be a successful businessman. I feel the same thing about other kinds of, of, of Ely Mossinary institutions, all of which depend um, on the expertise of, of, of outsiders, of which uh, businessmen are an important constituency. Well, we were talking about uh, political leaders. Uh, you've met a lot of the world's leaders. Uh, could you give me an idea of who's probably impressed you the most, you've been most, most impressed with as a person that you've come to know? Well, I, I have been very lucky in, in terms of the number of people I have been able to meet. Uh, part of that is my conviction that a business leader of a, of a truly global company must take the time and have the interest in meeting those kind of people. Some of them are important in terms of the actual decision-making concerning the reason we're all in business, namely to get orders. But a lot of them are peripheral to establishing a presence in some of these countries. And uh, so I think it's, it's part of one's job. But it also happened to be of interest to me. I would say of the, there are two or three people that probably in my lifetime have been really unusual leaders. One is obviously Churchill. Uh, another even though he led a very small country, is Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore. I think he's done a remarkable job. Admittedly, we're talking about a country of less than three million people. But uh, in the time I've spent with him, and I've been lucky enough to be with him for several hours on three or four different occasions, uh, he is an incisive, insightful, incisive thinker, and he clearly has had uh, great leadership talent that he's brought to bear on the on the, on Singapore. Uh, I think you probably have to give uh, Deng, Deng Xiaoping a lot of credit. Now, he, obviously, he's got had some real flat sides, but I think he's done quite a remarkable job in a, in, in China. Uh, uh, the results of which are f far better than than the country that he took over. Uh, and obviously there are a lot of things that we disagree that he has, has done in the past, but I think he's been quite an outstanding leader. So there are three or four in the world, that I think, over the last 30 or 40 years that I've been privileged to, to, to know that uh, have, have been maybe one level above the others. What about on the domestic scene? Well, I certainly in terms of presidential leadership, I, I think President Reagan did a remarkable job uh, here, too. There are differences of opinions, but the thing that I don't think we can disagree with is that he had a straightforward, easily understood philosophy, and he never wavered from that in terms of his administration. Clarity of understanding of positions is so important in politics, and we all know people who vacillate. You never know where they're going to come from on issues. Reagan, his 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 objectives, his message were very clear, and he uh, he he ran the country against those those uh, philosophical uh, uh, objectives that he had. I, I think rather effectively. In your uh, in your acceptance speech to the Lincoln Academy, uh, you quoted uh, George Bernard Shaw the uh, unreasonable man. Could you tell us a little bit about how, um, why, you, why you chose that and why you find that such a, an interesting point? Interesting well, I, I think it's human nature to be, respond cooperatively to one's environment. And uh, yet there are an awful lot of things that take the courage to be different, the courage to be unpopular, um, the courage to recognize the difference between being loved and being respected. And I think it's a, it, it is not something that is a natural inclination with a lot of people. And it's obviously overly simplistic to say that, that all progress are are made by people who expect the world to adapt to, to them. 
but there's some truth to the fact that that leadership uh, takes the courage to be different, the courage to take positions that are unpopular, the courage to uh, not accept the status quo. So uh, while the, the, the quote is somewhat simplistic, I think basically expresses um, a fundamental aspect of leadership that I think is important. I'd like to turn now, if I may, to uh, some of your outside interests. Uh, quite an active outdoorsman, pictures of you at the South Pole, uh, river rafting, a lot of different things. What do you get out of those activities? Let's start with photography. You love that, and you're very good at it. Well, I, I'm an amateur photographer. I don't have fancy equipment. And uh, I first got interested in it as a student, and I took some pictures on a trip. I love to travel, and I've always enjoyed that. I took some pictures up on the Amazon when I was a student of some um, parrots. and. I didn't know what they were, so when I got back, I took them into the Audubon Society, and they said, oh, my God, we've been looking for that picture, a picture of that bird forever. Uh, what is it? And I told them and so forth. And so uh, that sort of started me on a career, and uh, they, they, as a matter of fact, they, they, uh, they bought that picture for me, from, from me, which paid for my camera, for which as a student I was delighted. And I haven't done very much with it uh, until basically until, you know, the last five or six years when I had enough time to travel some of the places I wanted, and and I've enjoyed it. What did you get out of it? Did the pictures on my wall. I mean, I, uh, I, enjoy, I enjoy being outdoors. I enjoy nature. You'll notice that a lot of the pictures I've taken are in the Arctic, in the Antarctic. Uh, I tend to prefer cold weather than, than jungles uh, for a reason that I haven't quite figured out. Maybe one reason is you don't see too many people there, so it doesn't get too crowded. And, and um, so I, I've, I've just enjoyed the things that, that I've, uh, and we've taken some very unusual trips. We've been dog sledding up in, in Baffin Island, and we've been up chasing polar bears, as you can see from some of the pictures. Went down and lived with the emperor penguins for four or five days um, on the Waddell Sea. Uh, so, so I, I, it's it's not a necessarily a sense of adventure, but I enjoy different types of trips, and I've taken a lot of them. You've also uh, served on the uh, with the uh, Smithsonian's uh, Museum of Natural History. Uh, what's been particularly satisfying about that association? Cut. Okay. <laughs> okay. I tell you that we we might handle that differently, but uh, to answer that question honestly, I don't think you'd run it. Uh, I mean that has been the most frustrating goddamn experience of my life. Mm -hmm. But if you can say, you know, if you can say, well, if you can ask it some, some you, if you want to ask something about the, uh, the some of the extracurricular activities sure. that I've been involved in, that's fine. But if you want to make it that pointed, okay. I'll tell you, I either lie, which I won't do, okay. or you won't run the answer. <laughs> well, what about you? And incidentally, I'll tell you what the interest is if you want to answer the question again. The Natural Museum is one of the great assets of the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. one of the great assets of the of the world of, nat of natural history. And um, I, I felt, when I was asked, that a, a board, which they were just in the process of establishing, uh, would could be a great asset mm -hmm. to see that that museum is run up to its potential. And so that's why I did it. But getting it there... Well, so... Is, is, there a way we could, is there a way we could address that? Uh, you've opened it up to uh, uh, taking public input and drawing comments. Well, just to give you background on the things that I am associated with, you can ch pick and choose. I'm on the, the board of the University of Chicago, the board of trustees of the University of Chicago. I'm on the National Park Board. I'm on the, uh, uh, I'm on the Aspen Institute Board. I'm on several public policy boards. Hoover, I've been chairman of that in the past. I'm, I'm on the executive committee of the American Enterprise Institute. So, you know, you, I have been involved in a lot of them. I'm on the Argonne bo board. Uh, so I don't know if you want how you want to cover that general subject, but, but focusing in on the National Museum has to be done gingerly. It, it still could be the subject of pursuit. We could talk about it, 
but well you, you you described it as a national asset and uh, how uh, how has your association with it perhaps helped it to live up to its potential would that be a better way of asking yeah let's let well why did you decide to go on the board why did you decide yeah something let's pick up <coughs> okay the, the museum of natural history what what drew you to drew your interest in that area well, uh, the board of the National Museum of Natural History, which is part of the Smithsonian, was only created recently as a result of an outside consulting study that indicated that even though this was a unit of the Smithsonian, it ought to have its own independent board. And they approached me and a number of other people to go on the board and then asked me to be chairman. The reason I accepted was this is one of the great natural history museums in the world. And uh, the asset value of a museum of that stature seemed to me to justify some, some uh, support and some attention. And I felt that a board of outsiders consisting of both scientists and businessmen should be able to make a major contribution to how the museum was, um, was, was run. And so that's the, re the reason that I uh, ac accepted the, the uh, appointment. How has it improved the museum? Well, the jury is still out. Uh, there are a number of things that I think we've done to contribute to um, sharpening the focus of the museum. We've undertaken through a through the science committee of our board, which is which is um, chaired by a number of prominent scientists around the country, a new initiative as to how science at the museum should be undertaken. There are 130 scientists and a budget of 40 or 50 million dollars that are spent there on research. And we thought that that could be, uh, that we could take a different approach that might make research more effective. We're in the process of implementing that, and I think that's making some progress. We're addressing some of the issues of, of uh, governance that I think businessmen can bring to an institution like that that can improve how they operate. So I think we're, we're making some progress. I think that covers it well. Um, as I draw to a close, uh, I'd like to ask you... Uh, You've obviously been in a situation where you may have mentored younger people as they come up through uh, corporate corporate uh, environments. What sort of advice would you give people as they as they consider a career in business? They, as they uh, things they should do, things that uh, would help them along, um, both being successful in the world of business, but perhaps uh, looking to things that would make them personally satisfied as well. Things that they would. Well, of course, I start with the premise that business is a fascinating career. There are a lot of people who shouldn't be given that advice because we know they wouldn't find it a fascinating career. Uh, I have found it very rewarding and very satisfying. The advice I think I would give someone who had made the decision that they wanted to go into business, I don't think I would take on the challenge of trying to convince someone who wanted to be a musician that they should become a businessman, but on the assumption that we're talking about those who have, have decided they want to go into the business world, I would, I would tell them some of the things we've talked about before. Be sure that you don't over-focus on your day-to-day -day business requirements. I don't care where you are in the corporation. Obviously, it's easier for a chairman to spend time on extracurricular activities than it is for a, a person first starting out in business, but I don't think there is there, there is any reason at any level in a corporation for someone who is committed to succeed in, in, a, in a business career for not reaching out and participating in their external environment. And so I, uh, and we've discussed this, and I think the same thing is, is true in, in politics. I think I would advise them that in most corporations today, you will not succeed unless you have had some international uh, exposure. The world cannot function, our U.S. business cannot function successfully with leadership that doesn't understand the challenge of doing business overseas, doesn't understand the importance of different cultures, doesn't understand this, the, the difference between the role that government plays in some markets um, as opposed to the role that government plays in our market. So I would say that someone who's going to succeed tomorrow has got to have 
real on a you know, hands-on experience in the international world. Uh, so those, those, that's the kind of advice I would give, uh, I would give young people today. One final question, I'm, I'm asking this of all the laureates, and that has to do with their reflections upon being uh, uh, named a Lincoln Laureate. Uh, what does that mean to you? Well, I think the Lincoln Academy is an institution that is unique to Illinois. I mean, I don't think any other state has anything quite like it, where they genuinely want to honor citizens of their state in a whole host of, of, of endeavors and, and, the, and, a, and a variety of contributions that they've made. And I think that if you look over those who have received the laureates uh, for a, a whole um, variety of contributions that they've made, this is a very impressive group. And I think anyone who is asked would feel honored to be allowed to join such an illustrious group. So I, I, it was very pleasing to me to be to be asked, and and very rewarding, in retrospect, to be a lord of, laureate of the of the academy.